In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. I think the fast is a very good time for us to assess lots of things. And going through Lent, there's one question that actually occurs to me, and that is when we're fasting. We, see that we're, we say that we're fasting because of a preparation for the resurrection. The resurrection of whom? That's the question. I wonder how many Christians actually have a good understanding of who Christ is. And our Lord, as much as he was trying to guide and inspire his disciples, he understood their weaknesses, he understood their challenges. And we're told that in the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 16, that when he came into the region of Caesarea, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I the Son of Man am? Now, that is a question that really addresses how much he thought they were understanding the whole thing. Because he gives them the answer in the question. He says to them, who do men say I, the Son of Man, am? It's easy for us to try to determine who other people say God is. Whether it's Christians and we say, oh, these Christians think of him this way, these Christians think of him that way. Whether it's non-Christians and they believe that God is this or that. And it's very comfortable for us to sit in our own places and look and judge how others are seeing God. But then our Lord goes on to say to them, but who do you say that I am? Because when they responded, they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And so the next question is, but who do you say I am? Who, who am I to you? You've been following me? You've been my disciples? Who do you say that I am? And I think that's a question that we all need to ask ourselves. Who do we say that our Lord Jesus Christ is to us? To me, when I wake up in the morning and I'm praying, who am I praying to? When I'm walking through my day and something occurs to me and I remember him, who am I remembering? When I'm going through my day and I finish it and I come to the end and I want to give thanks to God, who am I thanking? It's easy to have generic answers, very generic answers. The answers that we've learned in Sunday school and youth meetings and Bible studies over, over, over decades. But who do we say he is? You know, there's, there's one particular event that happened in our Lord's ministry where he hears that Lazarus, his friend, is dead, and he goes back. His disciples think he's going back, that he can wake him from a sickness, but he didn't understand. Then he said to them, our, friend, our friend Lazarus is dead. And he goes back. Now he goes back, and they don't understand why. But he goes back that people may see what's about to happen and glorify him. He was going to do something spectacular. But the disciples were a little bit worried because St. Thomas, and coincidentally we always remember Thomas as the doubter, but actually it was St. Thomas in this account in the Gospel of St. John chapter 11 who's really courageous. And when they all warn our Lord and say, but, but they wanted to kill you, where are you going? St. Thomas stands up and says, let us, all, let us go that we may die with him. He was ready to go with his master to that point. 
Let us go that we may die with him. So they go back and of course he meets Mary and he meets Martha. And they both say almost identical things. Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. They were thinking of God's power in a very limited context. It was limited because, Lord, your power, we, we accept it, but only when you're here. And of course, if people think of our Lord in that context as, as a prophet, as a rabbi, then his powers are where he is. You know, it, it, it wasn't unheard of that prophets raised people from the dead or healed sicknesses. But they said to him, if you had been here, he would not have died. And he reminds them and tells them, who am I again? Did I not tell you that that if we die, we rise. And if you think about our own Christian education, we all know this. We all can rattle off you know, a particular formula of, yes, when we sin, we can repent and therefore we're forgiven. When we die, we rise and we live eternity in the kingdom of God. There are these, these formulae that we can just rattle out. And that's what they said to him. Yes, 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 we know there is a resurrection coming later and we'll all rise. And our Lord then stopped. And in verse 17, he says very clearly, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. I am the resurrection. It's not about what happens to you later. It's not about life later on. It's about what I bring to you. When we're fasting, when we're remembering our Lord, when we're remembering his sufferings and then his resurrection, it's not about an act that happened historically. It's about what he gives us until today. What he provides for us so graciously and so generously without reserve without reservation, without even thinking, his role was to save us, to give us life who we, who had died. And so we need to be with Mary and Martha and stop for a minute and think, okay, I can't just rattle things off. I can't just recite a formula that I don't really understand. Who is Christ to me? And what is his function in my life? And the answer is, he is my resurrection. He is my resurrection. He's my resurrection because he has become my hope. Don't forget that in the Old Testament there was hope in the fact that the Messiah was coming. The Savior was coming. That's where the hope was. And there are those who still wait for that. But for us, the hope is realized. The hope has come. The hope is here. And he is here eternally. God came once into the world in flesh, took flesh and became like us, and then gave us all life from that point on. What do we need to do? We need to realize that he's our resurrection. But let me tell you this, what does that actually mean? It means quite simply this, and this is again another, one of the, another formula. We say that sin 
is death because it is a distance from God. We separate ourselves from Him because we sin, because light and darkness cannot coexist. So the fact that we say that He is our resurrection, I am the resurrection, as our Lord says, the fact that He is our resurrection means that without Him there is no life. Without Him, if I die, I die. There is no resurrection from death. There's no hope. There's no life anymore. And so when we live our lives in the world, what are we trying to live with? If we're just going to follow this world, the example of this world, the rules of this world, the patterns and models of this world, without our Lord in the midst of them, then there is no life. But with Him is life. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Now again, there are two ways of looking at this. You can look at it as, why is God so selective and why is he so harsh? And, and why, why only those who believe in him? If he loves the whole of humanity, why wouldn't the whole of humanity live? Simple. Because we need to choose it. You know, it's, it's horrible to think, but there are people in this world who choose to end their lives mortally, who choose to die. We've just had debates in the last months about assisted suicides. We've just seen people in the past weeks blowing themselves up and killing others around them. So there are people who actively choose to end their lives. Likewise, there are people who choose to spiritually die. And it's horrible to hear it. But we also need to realize there's hope that even when we choose to spiritually die by sinning, there is always a way back. There's always recourse. There's always a way of, of being saved. Because He is the resurrection. So when I'm there, dead in sin, I just need to remember that He is my resurrection. And this is what we need to be focusing on during this Lent. When we focus during this Lent about what it means to rise with Him, it's a great opportunity to gather our sins, gather our shortcomings, gather our trespasses, and to cleanse, to repent, to confess them, so that when we receive the Feast of the Resurrection, then we receive it in the spirit of the resurrection. And that is with life and with hope. With an understanding that in him is life. And life everlasting. Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 16 verse 25 says, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's great. We all aspire to do wonderful things. We all want to go into the deepest, darkest parts of the world and serve the underprivileged. And serve the innocent who are there. But what about the small things? We speak about fasting, and we often think it's such a huge thing to do. It's just a huge sacrifice. We don't want to do it. We feel like we have to do it. We don't choose to do it. We feel like it's imposed on us. But what if that fasting is but a small sacrifice that we present? And let's face it, it's a sacrifice. We, we go 
out of our comfort zones. I'm sure that we'd prefer to eat other things or do other things or live our lives differently. But to be able to set aside a time of the year where we focus spiritually and focus on life and food just becomes a part of it, not the decisive part of it, just a part of it, but it's an intrinsic part. Then if we're able to focus on that during this time, we're able to gain so much more. If we follow this concept of losing one thing to gain another, then what we do is we, we focus less on the body, on the desires, on, on the appetite, on the hunger, on the satisfaction of those things, and in light of that we gain other things. It's, it's this eternal problem when you're, when you're studying and you have certain subjects and you don't know which ones to focus on. Or if you're working and you have certain projects, you don't know which one to focus on. Or even in relationships, you don't know, you know which, which social commitments to focus on. We all have to make those choices. We all have limited capabilities and we have to look at them and prioritize them. So with our limited capabilities, what are we looking to do? Am I willing to, for this period before the Feast of the Resurrection, am I willing to be able to put my spirituality first? And believe me, I know it's not an either or but it's a prioritization. It's where they fit on, on that scale. I'm not saying we shouldn't, I'm not saying we should ever neglect our bodies totally because we, we are entrusted with our lives. There was uh, one of the, the fathers who was um, a very learned father and at the time of Lent, if he saw one of the monks fasting excessively or excessively strenuously he would say that in Lent we are meant to subdue the body not kill it. Right? We are meant to to limit our attention to it but not completely ignore it. So within that context he who desires to save his life will lose it and that, that applies to our attention and our prioritization in the things we do. But then our Lord goes on to say, whoever desires to lose his life for my sake will find it. Will find what? Will find his life. But I already had my life. Yes, but you had it in a certain way that you weren't really making the best use of it. You weren't really capitalizing on it. You had it in a way where it wasn't the most efficient and the most glorious use of what we have. What do we have? We have the temple of God. We have the Spirit of God abiding in us. We have the image and likeness of God. We've got all the components for a great life. We've got all components for holiness. But life gets in the way. Life stops us from enjoying that. Life throws things at us that seem very good immediately. They, they satisfy lots of things right now. Even my own ego even my sense of importance, even my selfish desires, they're satisfied right now. But long term, what do they do? I'm sure you'd all like to walk out and have that big greasy meal. And it probably would taste very good. But long term, is it really benefiting us in terms of health? 
in terms of sacredness of the body, in terms of our stewardship over our own lives. So there's always a choice to make. And I also don't want to minimize things to the extent where it's body against spirit. Because that is, that's a battle that the saints have way, way, way down the spiritual path. But where we are today is trying to find a good balance between the body and the spirit. We're not trying to totally subdue the spirit like, like people like St. Bishoy or even St. John the Baptist. What we're trying to do is find the balance by which we focus spiritually. I was recently in Jordan and passed through the Jordan Valley and a um, beautiful moment is where I found the place where St. Mary of Egypt lived her life. And St. Mary of Egypt is one of the ascetic characters that has been significant in my life. I remember reading her story just a couple of months before I entered the monastery. And it was so moving. And it was just so uplifting and encouraging. And there I was in the place where she was. And when you hear the stories of how she actually lived in the deserts on her own until she met Saint Zosima, who came and, and ministered to her, the way the monks and nuns fasted at the time was really rigorous, really tough. That's because they had this incredible struggle they wanted to reach. And sometimes when we think of fasting, we think that's it. But there isn't one way to fast. That is the way that the ascetic fathers and mothers fasted. What we need to do today is to find a good balance through which we honor the body that God has given us, but we also build the spirit up that he has given us. And we build ourselves. And we try to build spiritually. Our tolerance, our love, our forgiveness, our ability to deal with, with the problems we meet along the way. Our ability to deal with our own shortcomings. Our ability to deal with temptation. Our Lord was very clear. In the world you will find tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. You're going to find that tribulation, that temptation along the way. And he gave us that very important model when he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. That was the model that said, don't worry if you're tempted carnally or with riches or even with your faith because I will give you the right tools to overcome. I will allow you and empower you to overcome. Just make sure you build those tools up. And that's our spirit. When we face temptation, it's not our body that's face, fighting back, it's our spirit. When we're facing weakness, spiritual weakness, it's not physical nourishment that's going to help us, it's spiritual nourishment. And we need to remember that along our journey. John 11:26. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Now that's a really tough verse to try to explain because of course we die of course we die and we rise spiritually if we believe in our Lord why will we never die because our life is just transformed into a new life it's one life becoming another death 
becomes a mere portal. It's just a passageway leading us from one place to the next. So it's important for us to understand that. That in that realization of what life is, I am gaining eternal life. I am choosing one thing here, but my choices impact the way I'm going to live. Now again, there are questions about punishment. Is there real punishment? Well, of course, there's no punishment, there's no physical punishment because there's no body to punish. We're in glorified bodies. We're not going to be flesh and blood and skin and bone. So that sort of punishment is out the window. But what, what is the punishment? Punishment is sitting back and thinking, wow, I had a chance to be over there with our Lord, and now I can't. And it's my fault. Have you ever thought and regretted the decision you've made, thinking that was really foolish? Because if I had chosen differently, my life would be very different right now. And I'm not talking to the married people here, because that, that would be suicide. That will be one of those decisions. One of those decisions is, I could have been there. I could have been with our Lord. I could have been in glory. And I had all the facilities. And I had all the means. And I had all the blessings. I had all the support. But I decided not to. And it's during these times of spiritual growth and fasting that we assess all of that. Knowing that to have Christ in my life today is to have life. And to continue to have him is to have continued life. And to build on that is to have eternal life. And that's the power of it. The power of it is he is there with us along the whole journey. Every moment of it. He's there with us along the good and the bad. Especially the bad because he wants to help us through it. But we need to stop. And having Lent the way we have it is a chance for us to completely stop. Now I'm sure, you're, I'm sure you'd know this fact. But in the early church, what they used to do was have baptisms into the church at the end of Lent. And that's why the last weekend you call Baptism Sunday. Because they would go through this whole catechism learning and then live in that spirit of Lent and preparation and then at the end of it be baptized into the new faith because it was a period of focus, a period of anticipation, and then a period at the end of which you celebrated exactly why you came into the faith. You came into the faith to be one with Christ because Christ is life. And so you celebrate life and you celebrate the resurrection. So we go back to the first question. Who do you say that I am? If our Lord met us today and asked us that question, who do you say that I am? Do I think he's just a prophet? Do I think he's just a nice person? Do I think he's just an instrumental figure? Do I think he's just a, an incredible leader? No. Other people of other faiths may think that of Christ. What we think is what was said in that encounter in Bethany. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ who has come into the world. I believe that you are my Savior. I'm preparing myself. 
I want to meet you and I want to meet you daily. I'm spending this fast because I want to communicate with you daily. I'm getting to know you more because I want to live with you forever. I'm getting ready to celebrate the single most important thing that you did for me and for the whole of humanity. And that is to give you a life, but then to rise and raise me with you, that even when I die, I rise and have life with you forever. And glory be to God forever. Amen.